coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan come to a close. We look at the issues returning veterans face in San Diego. And the powerful California Coastal Commission shuts down a San Diego Bayfront project. Will a new proposal meet a similar fate? KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Anita Sharma, in for Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. San Diegans marked Veterans Day by attending various events around the county honoring vets in the military. The biggest by far was on the USS Carl Vinson. The first ever Carrier Classic basketball game is just wrapping up aboard the Carl Vinson here on San Diego Bay. President Obama and the First Lady joined about 7,000 other spectators, most of them sailors and Marines. The Veterans Day contest was between Michigan State and North Carolina. The nationally televised game was a special treat for sailors from the Vincent, recently back from a six-month deployment. Even Mother Nature smiled on the spectacular event, stalling a storm heading our way. The 25th annual San Diego Veterans Day Parade kicked off this morning along Pacific Highway in downtown San Diego. The parade commemorated the 20th anniversary of Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Gay and lesbian veterans openly marched in the parade for the first time today, this following the recent repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Evelyn Thomas, a Desert Storm veteran, was at the parade to show her support. I think the San Diego uh, Gay Pride is marching in today's Veterans Parade, and that's a historical event. You know, it was a historical event for me to participate because I'm an openly gay veteran that advocates for LGBT veterans and their families. Now, in the past week, we've learned housing, jobs, health care, education are some of the biggest challenges facing our nation's veterans, especially those who have recently served in Iraq or Afghanistan. Tonight, we hear more about what's being done to address those issues in San Diego. On the streets of San Diego, it's estimated one out of four homeless people are military veterans. I, I think that the, the veteran homeless issue is going to continue to grow, mostly because of the influx of returning Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom veterans. San Diego's high cost of living and lack of affordable housing have made the situation even more severe. Today we're here with the uh, California Community and, uh, Housing Development in a partnership to roll out our program to assist veterans in housing. The second in charge of the Veterans Administration in Washington was in San Diego this week. He talked about the dismal jobs picture for young vets, mostly in their 20s. The unemployment rate for them, more than double the national average of 9%, he says, to compete in the civilian world. For many of them, it will require them to re-educate themselves, to take what they've learned about teamwork, about discipline, about applying the values that they've lived in the service, and then learning a new skill, whether that's a trade or going to a two-year college or a four-year college. And fortunately, we have something called the GI Bill, which will help pay for college to any private or public university in America. Another growing problem is the rate of suicide among Iraq and Afghanistan vets. About 5,000 are receiving some form of medical care at the VA San Diego health care system. Many of them are young people that don't really know what's going on. This is all new to them. So, so just meeting them at, at their level and, and providing to them what they're capable of at the moment is, is what we try to do. Counselors here say there are many signs you can look for when a person might be suicidal, including problems with family members, drastic changes in behavior, and sometimes a certain situation can trigger it. San Diego will need another $12.2 million annually to pay for maintenance over the next five years. That's in addition to the $31.8 million that Mayor Jerry Sanders has in his financial outlook. This conclusion from the city's independent budget analyst means deeper deficits in the first four years and a smaller than expected surplus in the final year. The city must whittle down a backlog of capital projects totaling $840 million. The city of San Diego is poised for yet another marketing deal with a private company. This one for vending machines could bring the city as much as $870,000 over the next five years. The agreement with Rainbow Vending would generate ad revenue for machines at city facilities. The company will be allowed to call itself San Diego's official beverage vending partner and place its logo on the city's website. Recently approved deals have Toyota providing lifeguard vehicles and Sprint providing cell phones. 
National Weather Service says high surf is hitting San Diego beaches, especially those facing south. Forecasters expect sets of 10 to 12 feet tonight with strong rip currents through tomorrow morning. Conditions could be dangerous, especially since beaches have relatively few lifeguards this time of year. The high surf advisory expires at 10 tomorrow morning. And a few minutes ago, we told you about some of the issues facing military veterans, especially those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. Amitha continues the discussion with a recap of some of the week's top stories at the Evening Edition Roundtable. Two of our top stories this week have a military theme appropriate for Veterans Day. One involves the serious issues facing veterans, especially those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. The other is a new proposal for a veterans park on Navy Pier. Roger Sholey from the San Diego Union Tribune and Tony Perry, San Diego Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times are my guests this evening. Tony, Roger, welcome. Tony, let's start with you. President Obama flew in today for the big game on the USS Vinson. Symbolically, how how big of a deal is this for the Navy and for vets? I think it's a great thing for Navy, vets, San Diego, the President of the United States, uh, college and uh, professional basketball, uh, this game, first game on a flat top on an aircraft carrier, an architectural marvel really, I think, that they built those stands right there on the carrier and the President of the United States is a big basketball fan, so he came out here and uh, as part of a um, Veterans Day celebration, and we're all going to have fun, and the weather cooperated. There had been talk the game would get rained out. That has not occurred. Rain maybe uh, midnight or early tomorrow, but not tonight. Beautiful game under a beautiful sky and a great diversion from some more grim news, but also a way to celebrate and honor what this day is, which is Veterans Day. Is this going to happen? Uh, is this a one-shot thing, or do you think it will happen again? Well, there's talk of moving it around. Maybe uh, Florida, maybe Seattle, maybe San Francisco, wherever there's a, a mm. ship big enough. Maybe we'll put it on land next time. Uh, we'll see. It's expensive. Mm. It's complicated. They're mm. critics. Mm. So mm. we'll see. And we'll see uh, also, you know, how the teams do. Does another team want to do this next year mm -hmm. or not? So, uh, mm. so enjoy it while you can because it may or may not come back again. Tony, you said it's a great diversion from some of the grim news that we've heard. Let's talk about a little bit about that grim news. Unemployment is among the many challenges that veterans are facing. It's in the double digits, whereas the national rate, unemployment rate, is at 9%. Why is it higher for veterans? Well, it's about 12% by one study. Don't get too wrapped around the axle on numbers, however. It's hard to boil out demographics and say, you know, is it apples and apples, apples and oranges? Well, for one thing, this economy is ill, and it's hard to... Uh, step out of the economy, private economy, go into military service and then step back in when your peers have all gotten entry-level jobs and starting to work their way up. There also may be concerns about who these veterans are. Do they have PTSD? Do they have traumatic brain injury? I mean, we've done, uh, we've all done story after story about some of these problems. Maybe private employers are scared. I don't know. Now, veterans get preference at almost all governmental levels for jobs, yes, but governmental employment is being cut back. So. Any factor you, you want to consider is, is cutting against the idea of a lot of guys getting out and quickly getting a, 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 into either the private or the public economy. And one figure is some 900,000 veterans uh, are jobless. Well, there's millions of people jobless. So, and it's also hard, I think, to think of curing the joblessness among veterans without curing the joblessness in the overall economy. Tony, is it, is it the veterans that were in briefly like four to six years that are having problems or the ones who are ve uh, career veterans who have been in for 20 years? I think it's more um, the four years, mm. the hitch, the young fellows and young women who, again, they went in while their peers were either going to college or getting technical training or getting entry-level jobs, and now they are through with their hitch. Maybe they're in the reserves. They want to come back out. And the economy has changed. It has soured. And so the, uh, the America that they left when they went into military service isn't the one they're mm -hmm. coming back to. Mm -hmm. 
So the Senate on Thursday approved President Obama's jobs plan, and that includes giving companies who hire unemployed military veterans tax breaks. How far is that expected to go in, in helping veterans get back on their feet? Well, Michelle Obama, the, uh, the First Lady, she's talking about 100,000 jobs for veterans uh, through a variety of uh, modes, including tax breaks, including having private companies hitch up their pants and train veterans themselves, including uh, affirmative action at, at both the local and, and federal level. It's going to be tough. It's really going to be tough. All this has been tried before, by the way. We're not reinventing the, uh, the wheel here. Affirmative action is real. Tax breaks have been used before. Various companies have stepped up before. We'll see. The, the, again, the overarching factor is the overall economy is sick and not getting better quickly. Hard to cure one aspect of it, joblessness among veterans, with, while the rest of it is still floundering. Do you think they're better off um, as new employees with their military training? They have a lot of uh, skills they get in the military. That's part of the reason we're going in. Uh, they're, they're disciplined. They know how to, they have a work ethic that other people may not have. It, it seems like they would have a benefit, just personally be better off employees and the non-military And people. that's the argument, and that's the argument that uh, military brass try to spread among, uh, among private employers. We'll see. I, I haven't really seen an absolutely objective, hard-nosed job analysis. Can you step from being in the military, which after all is a government-style job mm -hmm. in many ways, can you step, for example, into the private economy? Or are there things, skills that you may learn in the military which really are pertinent to the military, key to the military, but don't really transfer over. Mm -hmm. I don't know, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'm, I'm reluctant to buy into these sort of un, unchallenged assumptions. It, well, we will say this, it's tough and getting tougher for these guys, these women, particularly when they come back from Iraq and, and Afghanistan, to just step back in and boom, mm -hmm. get themselves a nice entry-level job. There isn't much call for an infantry a grunt in the private economy. There isn't much call for a lot of the skills that they have picked up. They may have picked up work habits mm -hmm. and discipline, as you say, but the, the specific skills. And a lot of companies, they want you skilled the day you arrive. They're not into training you. That's one of the things that the president's uh, program would do, encourage and underwrite much of the training going on in private companies so that a veteran who may not have the exact training that I don't know, uh, name it, FedEx, IBM, whatever, uh, needs, he can get trained that way rather than being turned down by, hey, you don't have those skills, we'll hire three other people who didn't serve who do have those skills. I want to jump in here really quickly and talk about military cuts. Um, we've fought two wars in the past decade, troops are coming home, and now hundreds of billions of dollars, $450 billion in cuts are being proposed. What kind of cuts are under consideration for the military? Well, military budget has doubled in the last 10 years as we have fought uh, two wars. We're talking $450 billion over a decade. That's a 7 to 8 percent cut. Things have already started to be cut. Big ticket items, the expeditionary fighting vehicle that the Marines wanted, some aircraft uh, projects, some artillery projects already being cut. The numbers are going to be cut. One figure I've seen is 50,000 uh, fewer soldiers. We're going to reduce those numbers. 15,000 fewer Marines, so personnel. But also there's talk that more sacrosanct uh, items are also on the table, pensions, health care, just like the private sector. When you look at an overall budget and you look at paying people who are no longer actively providing goods and services, as it were, and their health care, it's real expensive. And should you either ask them to contribute more for both of those or should you just cut? Real, real difficult, controversial style. But uh, those are not off the table. Those are on the table cuts in pensions and health care. Switching gears now to another topic, the idea of a veterans park next to the Midday Museum on Navy Pier. Last week, the Coastal Commission reversed its approval of plans for that stretch of land. This week, another proposal emerged. Tell us about that proposal. Well, this is the proposal by the uh, USS Midway uh, Aircraft Carrier Museum to build a park on the pier, which is next to it. And at the foot of the pier would be two things, a permanent home for the San Diego Symphony's Pops concert and a set of uh, skyscraper-sized wings, I call them, one 500 feet, one 400 feet, soaring above the city uh, with uh, sheeted in uh, titanium. And it would be a spectacular 
image on the bay, and uh, it's already paid for by a donation from Denny Sanford, a, a person from South Dakota with a part-time uh, home in San Diego, and the rest of the money is to, uh, to be raised by the Carrier Museum. Whose idea was it? Well, the idea was uh, Mainland Burnham, a, a businessman, a philanthropist, civic leader for many years in San Diego, and he, for years, has been wanting to have the, the equivalent of the Sydney Opera House in San Diego, a, a beautiful sculpture that we would see. It would be in all the postcards, it would be in all the architecture books. It would be San Diego's uh, Valentine to the world, saying, look at us, we have this fabulous piece of uh, beautiful art. Come see it in person. What's the chances the Coastal Commission will buy off in this? They, anything that looks to block views, be it Oceanside or San Diego, gets their thumbs down. How are they going to go with these titanium sails? I don't think the sails are the uh, big issue for them. It'll be this park. The park is proposed on top of the parking lot that's there now. So it would be about 20 feet into the air. And if you're standing on Harbor Drive, you won't be able to see the bay because it'll be this platform on top of the a parking lot. So I think they're, they may kill the idea of, at the outset saying, no, we don't allow, we won't allow you to build this platform. And the alternative ar argument is that if you want parking on the waterfront to, ser to serve thousands of people coming to the Midway, which is a very popular, most popular aircraft carrier museum in the country, we've got to provide parking. There's no nowhere else to put it. This is a good compromise. So they're going to have to weigh the pros and cons. How's the public going to take it? Well, we've done an informal, unscientific poll in the newspaper's website, unitrip.com. You can, you can vote until next Saturday, whether you like it or not. And so far, we've gotten about 1,600 uh, votes. How does exactly, that compare to other polls? Well, I mean, it, it, that... it's probably bigger than most. <laughs> and exactly, what's surprising to me is that exactly 50%, every single day I have to look at this, or a few hours, is exactly 50% pro and con, some very, very heated comments from people who love it or they think it's the worst thing we've ever seen. What are some of the comments that you're hearing? And by the way, you can also register your opinions on our website. So we'll add the, we'll the two polls together. <laughs> right. so, so what sorts of comments are you hearing? Well, there's some comments about the money should be spent for something else, or this is the wrong design, or it's too big, or it shouldn't be one philanthropist uh, thing for San Diego, which there should be more public input as to what it should be. Uh, some people just don't like the design period, and it reminds me of arguments 100 years ago or more of the Eiffel Tower or the Washington Monument before that or any number of icons we take for granted on the world scene have gone through uh, converse, uh, debates like this all the time. So we shouldn't be surprised that it's controversial. It's, it's good to have controversy. Um, I think the, the question will be, um, does San Diego need an icon? Or do we need some other image like this? And that'll be the central question. Very quickly, what's next for the design plan? There's going to be three public meetings starting at the end of the month by the, the museum is going to hold where people can talk about it. And on December 13th, the Port District Board will, will come back together and decide whether they want to endorse it or move it forward and put it part of their master plan amendment for the whole Embarcadero. Gentlemen, thank you so much for speaking to me today. Pleasure. Coming up next, the story of a San Diego man who trains birds of prey to keep other birds like seagulls and starlings away from landfills and from tourists at the Hotel Dell. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, PBS's longest-running public affairs series, featuring Washington's top journalists analyzing the week's news stories. Washington Week. Then at 8.30, broadcast media and the web unite with input from an engaged audience on Need to Know. And at 9, American Masters on the PBS Arts Festival features Bill T. Jones. That's all tonight on KPBS. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, finding jobs for veterans, protecting against pneumonia in Nicaragua, plus Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by
For years, the Hotel Del Coronado has had to deal with seagulls stealing food from its guests. This year, they tried a unique approach to solving the problem. KPBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando shows us what a modern falconer has done to help the hotel. If the skies above the Hotel Del Coronado are clear of birds, then Jorge Herrera is doing his job. A wild gull living off of Del Coronado food is a, is a very lucky bird and very, very fortunate. Um, so all we're doing is just scaring them, intimidating them. What George does is he brings up, uh, brings in his birds, uh, sets them up here on our Windsor lawn. Then he will walk around the property. What it does is it obviously they're birds of prey, so they frighten the other smaller birds and the seagull. Herrera provides bird abatement services through his company, X Falconry. He keeps the pest birds under control by bringing in what he calls his squadron of natural predators. I want the goals to be scared, intimidated, and not want to be around the presence of a natural predator. And by doing so, we keep them from uh, coming in and stealing food. I want to overload their senses. It's called, I call it a freak out. I want to freak them out. They see the wolves of the sky, sharks of the sky, they clear out. There's good reason for the smaller birds to freak out. Hawks and falcons, like the ones Herrera brings, can be lethal to other birds, says Safari Park's Kim Caldwell, whose favorite bird of prey is a peregrine falcon named Java. They are the fastest animal in the world. In a hunting dive, peregrines have been clocked at speeds in excess of 240 miles per hour. So the speed is just <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, so they are designed for high-speed pursuit, and the one thing that really uh, holds the, the falcon above all these other raptors is the fact that they almost exclusively take prey from the air. But Herrera doesn't have to do much more than show up to scare the gulls. The simple tactic of walking around with his hawk on a perch or doing short flights is enough to flush the pesky birds away. It's an easy job for his predators. They pretty much lounge out here. They get some sun, some nice, uh, nice cool ocean breeze. I'll, I'll miss them with a spray bottle or have bath pans out for them. Very minimal activity because it's they don't have to be up in the air the whole time to, to get the the pre, the, the uh, effect. But the seagulls don't abandon the hotel easily. When Herrera brings out his hawk, the gulls first respond by increasing their numbers. So what they're trying to do is intimidate her in numbers. So they're making a ruckus with that ruckus also. You'll notice that there was gulls on the sand on the beach. They cleared out of the area. They, they heard the others calling out that there's a predator in the area, warning call, so they started clearing out because their instinct is survival of the fittest. Fight or flight, they're going to clear out. The gulls also proved to be smart. They learn Herrera's schedule and hang out at the hotel on his days off. He's a little smarter than the birds, so he does outsmart them. But they know him, so it's, that's comical. All these birds are a lot smarter than most people give them credit for. Uh, seagulls and corvids like crows and ravens, uh, they can recognize people's faces and, and recognize danger in individual birds. And they recognize Herrera and his birds of prey. So the crows would be in those palm trees. As soon as they see me, crows would recognize me and start alarming. Herrera mixes up his schedule and the birds start to clear out and stay out. Herrera may scare gulls away, but he attracts hotel guests. Here, we'll put it right here. Oh, yeah, look at the birds. They want to snap pictures and learn more about the birds. They do recognize me, but they're not affectionate like a cat or a dog. It, it's all just, they're comfortable, they recognize you, and, and they, they're, they tolerate you because they're still wild. Good girl. Herrera considers himself lucky because his hobby is his job. It has a lot of rewards as well as some minor dangers. And the biggest thing is I have to be careful when I have her this high to point her away because she will go to the bathroom and drop it on my head. That was Beth Accomando reporting. Falconer Jorge Herrera has finished his season at the Hotel Dell. He's now providing his bird abatement services at landfills in the Inland Empire. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Looking for something fresh? How fresh? How about a new sleuth for the 21st century? The name's Sherlock Holmes. And Dr. Watson. You get off on this, you enjoy it. Oh. What is it like in your funny little brains? It must be so boring. Sherlock. Sunday at 9 on KPBS. Throughout its 50-year history, KPBS's news and public affairs programs have challenged conventional thinking. We're investigating issues before they reach a crisis. Our world is much more than just today's headlines, and KPBS helps all of us explore what's next so that we can take action now.
Tuesday at 10 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight, we want to hear from you about your concerns over the widening gap between the rich and poor in the U.S. National polls show a majority of Americans are worried about the wealth gap, and many believe that the hallmark of America's founding principles, the opportunity for upward mobility, is crumbling. While the wealth gap between the rich and poor has widened, so has the gap between older and younger Americans. In the past 25 years, Years, net worth of younger Americans has gone down, while net worth of older Americans has gone up. What do you think? How do you view your prospects and those of your children to make good on the American promise and succeed? You can help us cover the story by joining our Public Insight Network. Go to kpbs.org pin to share your story. Next week, we bring you a special series on aging in San Diego. At the beginning of the year, the oldest members of the baby boom generation turned 65. Baby boomers now make up 26% of the U.S. population. That means 10,000 baby boomers will turn 65 each day for the next two decades. In our series, we'll explore what that means for the San Diego community, from working past retirement to living alone, from learning music to making difficult decisions about end-of-life care. What it means to grow old right here in San Diego, our series starts on Monday. And now here's Dwayne with a recap of tonight's top stories. The first ever college basketball game on an active military vessel is just wrapping up in San Diego Bay. The Carrier Classic drew about 7,000 spectators, including President Obama and the First Lady. It was also a treat for the crew of the USS Carl Vinson on this Veterans Day. They recently returned home after a six-month deployment. San Diego is on the verge of a marketing deal with Rainbow Vending. The company will share hundreds of thousands of dollars in ad revenue and sales. The vending machines will be placed at city facilities. The city of San Diego will have to come up with more money for street maintenance. San Diego's independent budget analyst says its projection for the next five years is more than $12 million short. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. We leave you with a look at the forecast and some rain headed our way.